Welcome back, everyone, to Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and other platforms. And I left off last month with the latest installment in my series on the history of the United States and 100 objects. The last one was the fourth in the series about the main Norse coin, which is a small silver coin minted in Norway that was reportedly found at an archaeological site in Maine dating to the pre-Columbian era. So it's the only authentic Norse artifact ever found in the United States if the find is genuine. So it's a very important new object to talk about. It's the first that deals with contact between Europe and America. So if you want to hear about it, please go to my Patreon page. The link is in the description and become a patron for any amount, even if it's just a dollar, and you'll have access to those patron-only installments. So now today I'm going to go back and talk about another development in the creation of the modern world. So this is going back to my lectures I've been giving about the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and so on. And this one will address a subject that a couple of patrons asked me to talk about, which is the rise of absolutism and the age of monarchy. So at some point I'll probably talk about France and England, but first I'm going to talk about the sort of broad middle of Europe. Uh, the very fragmented, decentralized region, basically between France on the western side and Russia on the eastern side that we can broadly call Central Europe, which most of which was included in the Holy Roman Empire and which was very fragmented and decentralized through most of this whole era but which ended up becoming the sort of proving ground for the first superpower monarchical dynasty in Europe, which is the Habsburgs. So the Habsburgs are the family that very unexpectedly end up uh, rising to incredible power and really towering over the entire history of Europe in a way, but especially over Central Europe. So as I said, this area most of it was technically within the borders of the Holy Roman Empire, which, you know, as Linda Richmond said, is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. But it was a kind of loose uh, confederation of feudal states, principalities, fiefdoms, and ecclesiastical states kind of scattered in a crazy jigsaw pattern all around what's now Germany, Switzerland, a lot of northern Italy, some of Eastern Europe, and the Low Countries. And the Holy Roman Empire technically drew its ancestry, its, its founding, from Charlemagne and the division of Charlemagne's empire by his successors. And the Holy Roman Empire more or less started out as the eastern branch that broke off from Charlemagne's territories and that for a long time was really existed only on paper, uh, even if that. It was just a sort of technicality to say that this region was in some way a kind of larger empire with an imperial throne, and it was really run by local potentates and princes. And it more or less disappeared from the historical record for a time until in the 10th century, so a hundred years or so after the end of Charlemagne's empire, certain German rulers tried to kind of reassert it and reorganize it. And it continued to exist in some sense through the high and late Middle Ages. But it was very weak and decentralized. It didn't really have its own standing military forces. It didn't have a coherent foreign policy. Uh, the emperors did try to assert some control over church policy and trade within the borders of the empire, but it was really a struggle, and a lot of their conflicts they actually lost to the popes. Um, but... They did have a continual line of emperors, 
And these Holy Roman emperors were not hereditary. There was no single dynasty. It wasn't passed down from father to son. Rather, each emperor was elected, and there was a certain selection of a few important princes, like, say, the, the princes of Saxony or of the Palatine, who were considered uh, kind of leaders of the empire and who had the power to vote in these elections for the emperor. So each time an emperor died or abdicated, they would have to somehow come up with a way for these few princes to vote and agree on a new emperor. And this electoral system really reinforced the fact that it was actually these local rulers who really held the power, and that even once an emperor had been crowned, he still owed his authority to these more minor princes within the empire. The borders of the empire included basically all of what's now Germany and Switzerland, most of the Netherlands and Belgium, some chunks of Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, and a pretty big chunk of northern Italy as well. But in the high and late Middle Ages, the various Italian cities, as they grew, like Venice, uh, Milan, Torino in northern Italy, they asserted their effective independence more and more. And there actually was a sort of long internal political struggle within these various cities between those who favored uh, recognizing the power of the emperor, who were called Ghibellines, the Ghibelline party, those who favored the pope, and church power, who were called Guelphs, and all kinds of other parties that wanted local autonomy and often republican rule within these cities. And over time, the actual power of the empire in Italy was sort of slowly hollowed out until it was just a really, you know, bare, paper-thin formality. And politics in Italy really became a sort of constant contest of power between the various city-states and also among the parties within these cities, like in Florence and Venice. The Italian cities were able to sort of assert this independence and actually kind of come out on the world scene in the 14 and 1500s as significant, uh, you know, powers of, uh, of their own, on standing on their own feet and on their own bases of economic and political power for at least a period of, you could say, 50, 60 years, sort of in the early Renaissance. But this kind of security and self-assertion by these Italian cities really first came under threat beginning in 1480, when the Turkish Empire having already conquered Constantinople and basically all of the old Byzantine territories in Greece and the Balkans, then set their sights on Italy. And in the year 1480, the Ottoman Empire launched a fleet to invade Italy and actually successfully landed, besieged, and captured the city of Otranto at the southern end of Apulia. And they, as often happened, they slaughtered a lot of the inhabitants and any people who resisted in the area of Otranto in a sort of, uh, you might say, kind of shock and awe strategy, where the, the empire would first kind of uh, destroy all resistance, instill fear, and then would institute a more peaceful, stable rule. And it seems that the plan of the Ottoman Empire in, at this time was to continue launching more fleets and more armies and to conquer northward through Italy with the goal of eventually capturing Rome. So the way that the Turks viewed the situation, uh, they were the successors of the Byzantine Empire. They had successfully uh, captured Constantinople. They were now the heirs of Byzantium and hence of Rome. Right? The Byzantine Empire considered itself the Roman Empire. 
And so the Ottoman sultans, in their view, were the new Roman emperors, and hence it was only right and natural that they should rule over Rome itself. So this seems to have been their long-term plan at the time when they landed and captured Otranto. It just happened that the following year, in 1481, when they might have continued this campaign into Italy, the emperor died and there was a succession crisis back in Constantinople. And so the generals and diplomats who were supposed to oversee this campaign into Italy instead withdrew and rushed back to Constantinople to take part in this power struggle uh, back in the capital. And hence, this invasion of Italy was called off and was never actually launched again. But nonetheless, the capture of Otranto sent a serious message through Italy that if they didn't somehow unify and put forward a common defense under a powerful leadership structure, then they were vulnerable to conquest, just as Constantinople and the Byzantine territories had fallen to the Turks. So... Italy, in a sense, was saved from this threat by the succession crisis and could kind of breathe easy, at least for a few years, that they weren't under, uh, you know, directly under the sights of a new invader. But that didn't last long because at the same time, other European powers, particularly France and Spain, were adopting similar strategies and similar reforms to the Ottomans with new large uh, armies, with pyramidal command structures, and especially gunpowder and artillery units. And so while Italy was still in this kind of fragmented and weak state, uh, both the French and the Spanish started to intrigue and look for uh, favorable allies within these kind of feuding parties in Italy, and as their kind of Cold War contest for power in Italy escalated, eventually in 1494, both the Spanish and the French found pretexts to start moving armies directly into Italy, and they started attacking and using these old Italian cities, a lot of which were still just medieval walled cities, as kind of pawns and bases for a war with one another. And these Italian wars lasted and continued on and off for more than half a century, from 1494 to 1559. And a lot of these cities like Florence and Pisa were really devastated by this constant warfare, uh, constantly having to raise money, raise armies, uh, and withstand attacks from both sides. Uh, Rome basically survived these wars, but was constantly under threat or being captured or traded back and forth. Popes often had to take shelter as Rome was repeatedly occupied by the French and the Spanish back and forth. And a lot of these cities in Italy had to survive and deal with this situation by hiring mercenaries. And this was a double-edged sword. You know, you might hire experienced mercenaries, especially from Switzerland, which was a, a major source of mercenaries at this time. And they might, you might be able to effectively defend yourself by just sort of throwing money at the problem and stationing mercenaries around the perimeters of your city or of your territory. But those mercenaries had no particularly particular loyalty or tie to the city itself. And hence, almost at any moment, they might simply turn around and point their weapons back at the city and say, hey, we just tripled our price. Now you have to pay us uh, three times as much bounty or we'll attack you. And some cities actually ended up getting sacked or occupied and held hostage by the same mercenaries that they had just hired. So it was a real time of strain, especially for smaller cities. And this is actually a lot of what prompted Machiavelli to write his books, The Prince and the Discourses, about how to deal with this kind of world of disorder and instability that he was seeing around him in Florence in the 1500s. And The Prince is, of course, about how to play people off against each other, keep people afraid of you, and kind of blaze a trail for yourself in this disorderly world. And then in The Discourses, which is about the 
rule of a republic, he argues that for a republic to work, all the citizens have to be armed and trained and mobilized into a kind of citizen army. And this is because, you know, he didn't see it as sustainable in the long term to protect a city through foreign mercenaries. So you had to have an armed citizenry. One group that actually was able to deal with this situation and kind of um, rise to power again, despite this collapse into disorder, was the Medicis. So it was the Medicis who rushed back, were able to seize power again in Florence and exiled Machiavelli himself. And they not only were able to reestablish control of Florence, but gradually over the mid and late 1500s, they sort of annexed these smaller, weaker cities around them and created the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. So you got a, a, a dynasty of Medici Grand Dukes who no longer sort of uh, kept up this pretense of just being citizens or, you know, first among equals of the Republic, but who actually made a monarchy uh, and a kind of miniature Medici empire uh, in Tuscany. And this was a state that was able to reorganize and uh, use and master these gunpowder technologies to maintain at least some stable base of power through the late 1500s and early 1600s. And this is then the, the, the dynasty that patronized Galileo and other important philosophers and scientists in the 1600s, until eventually the Grand Duchy of Tuscany also fragmented and fell apart and kind of became a pawn of foreign powers again, like like much of the rest of Italy did over the course of the 17 and 1800s. So at this time when you had huge armies sort of uh, maneuvering around each other, back and forth, engaging one another across Italy in the 1500s and the 1600s, camp diseases broke out again with, uh, with a vengeance, and particularly the bubonic plague which had really diminished and been gotten under control gradually through the 14 and 1500s, it broke out again in the 1600s and really devastated a lot of these cities, including Rome, uh, both because of these large armies with their unsanitary camps and also because of the Little Ice Age and the, the return of cold winters and bad uh, crop yields and food shortages. Uh, so Italy was one of the places hit hardest by, by the Little Ice Age and the general crisis of the 17th century. So that gives you a little uh, sense of, of the trajectory of Italy at this time, at least of the northern and central areas of Italy that fell under the Holy Roman Empire. Just north of them, of course, was Switzerland, Switzerland was largely spared from these wars and plagues, mainly because it's so mountainous and, and isolated, so it wasn't really possible to move giant French or Spanish armies in there. Uh, they were fairly secure, and there weren't as big concentrated populations, so you didn't have the same outbreaks of plague. And Switzerland was able to sort of maintain itself as a little confederation of kind of miniature republics, although some of them had monarchs, they were basically little self-governing participatory cities uh, like Zurich and Bern and Geneva. So what Italy had been in the late Middle Ages actually lasted a bit longer in Switzerland. And what eventually really weakened Switzerland from within was not so much uh, political factions or disease, but the religious divide. So Protestantism really made strong inroads, and Switzerland, especially Zurich and Geneva, became the first bases, uh, the kind of headquarters of reformed Protestantism, whereas other cantons remained Roman Catholic, and the two eventually went to war. This is what killed Ulrich Zwingli, one of the great uh, reforming uh, uh, Protestant theologians. He was uh, a leader and soldier of Zurich, and he w ended up being killed in battle in one of these many skirmishes, skirmishes between Zurich and the Catholic cities. 
And eventually, as this conflict heated up, foreign powers got involved, and particularly Catholic powers like France and Austria uh, sort of intervened and tried to sway the politics of Switzerland in favor of the Catholics. And so, although it was not devastated to the same degree as Italy, it did end up, again, becoming a kind of pawn for larger power plays. Meanwhile, at the same time, in north of Switzerland, you have this whole complicated array of German states, all of which are governed differently. Some are basically like republics. Some are ruled by church bodies. Some are ruled by local rulers. And they, too, divide over religion. And at first, it, it's a divide between Catholics and Lutherans in the early stages of the Reformation, and then Reformed Protestants become uh, a player on the scene as well, and particularly the Palatine region in western Germany, near the border with France, ends up becoming a Reformed Protestant stronghold, like Geneva and the Netherlands and Scotland. So if we look at the Holy Roman Empire, from this kind of broad view around 1500, we see almost complete chaos, uh, division and unpredictability, and various parties kind of unprepared to deal with the new conditions of the gunpowder era. And one particular family ended up stepping into this kind of unstable power vacuum and taking advantage of it, taking advantage of this fragmentation, rivalry, intrigue, and the new force of gunpowder. And this is the Habsburgs. And quite, uh, in, in a quite unforeseeable way, one of the, you know, just bizarre incidents of European history is that the Habsburgs end up rising to be the premier family in Europe. They tower over European affairs for hundreds of years. <clears throat> they really effectively become the de facto rulers of Central Europe and even of other countries outside of Central Europe. And their domains really never made a lot of sense geographically, ethnically, they were always a kind of assemblage of different territories that they were able to bring under their control by one stratagem or another. They were sort of the, you might say, kind of uh, the Lannisters, you know, the, the, of, of real European history. They were the intriguers and the opportunists. And the historian A.J.P. Taylor famously said of the Habsburgs, quote, in other countries, dynasties are episodes in the history of the people. In the Habsburg Empire, peoples are complications in the history of the dynasty, right? There was never really anything that made their empire make sense other than the fact that it was all being ruled by one ruler from one family. So where did the Habsburgs come from? Well, they were originally Swiss. They started out as the Counts of Habsburg, ruling a sort of small fiefdom in northern Switzerland. Uh, we don't know exactly when the family started or how, but by around 1000 or so, they were the Counts of this uh, town and fiefdom of Habsburg. They had a small mountaintop castle there, some of which still stands. You can still see Habsburg Castle. And they sort of asserted themselves and sought for opportunities to gain power, to gain favor among other neighboring noble families. In 1274, they, someone in the area proclaimed them and gave them the honorary title of King of the Romans sort of casting them as heirs of the Roman imperial throne, much like Charlemagne had been, and much the same way that the Holy Roman emperors claimed to be. But they sort of took up this title of King of the Romans in this local area of northern Switzerland and southern Germany, and sort of asserted their supremacy over that limited region. Not long after, in 1282, they were able to obtain rule over the Duchy of Austria. 
And Austria at this time was not a major kingdom. It was a sort of minor duchy in the southeastern corner of the Holy Roman Empire. But it did have significant fertile farmlands along the Danube. It had a sizable capital at Vienna. And the Habsburgs sort of start to use Austria as their main base of operations and power. And they, again, seek favor, uh, build alliances, make uh, strategic marriages to try to get more domains added into their roles. And most importantly, in 1437, they make a diplomatic marriage that brings the kingdoms of Bohemia and Hungary under their role, under their rule. And Bohemia and Hungary are both sort of south and east of Austria. So they're now starting to extend their domains deeper into central and even eastern Europe and beyond the technical bounds of the Holy Roman Empire. And with this marriage, they really sort of rise to prominence as the most important ruling noble family in Central Europe. And so not too surprisingly, in 1440, Habsburg is elected as for the first time as Holy Roman Emperor. So they now become, you know, titular heads of this kind of formal confederation embracing all of Central Europe. And they use this sort of prestigious title to advance their power and their prominence on the whole European scene. And from then on, the Habsburgs become in a sense, de facto owners of the imperial throne. And only Habsburgs are elected as Holy Roman Emperor from then on, with one exception, from then on until the extinction of the Holy Roman Empire in 1806. So from this point onward, really, the imperial throne becomes like a family property, and the elections become simply a pro forma you know, performance. They also begin using a family insignia of the letters A-E-I-O-U. Now, this, of course, is just the vowels in the Latin alphabet in order, but various different meanings have been attributed over the years to this insignia, A-E-I-O-U, and there are actually early notebooks belonging to uh, Habsburg rulers where they gave possible interpretations of what the letters stand for. And they tend to mean, they tend to be taken to mean something to the effect of Austria rules the entire globe. So at one point, it was claimed that the letters stand for Alles Erdreich ist, ist Österreich untertan basically meaning the entire world is subject to Austria, or in Latin, Austriae est imperare orbi universo. Austria is the ruler of the entire globe. So it seems maybe in a sort of coded, veiled way at first, they start entertaining the idea that they are rulers of the entire world, that there is no limit, and that they are the sort of new universal kings or universal emperors. And this is an idea that had floated around at least since the Roman Empire uh, in Europe and also in, in the Middle East and in India, the notion that ultimately there should be just one supreme emperor of the entire world and that, you know, really any empire if you look at their thinking, their mentality, any empire always thinks that they really have no limit. There might be temporary boundaries where they have to deal with, you know, rebellious barbarians, but that properly speaking, they are entitled to rule the entire world. And by the late 1400s or so, it seems that certain Habsburg's rulers were starting to think of themselves this way as kind of unlimited universal emperors. In 1477, the Habsburgs were also able to acquire control of the Low Countries, you know, the Netherlands and Belgium, by their marriage to Mary of Burgundy, the female ruler of the Low Countries. And the Duchy of Burgundy that Mary ruled was 
basically the successor state of what had been the middle section of Charlemagne's empire. So by this strategic marriage with Mary of Burgundy, you could say they were putting two-thirds of what had been Charlemagne's empires back together, although they couldn't rule it in quite the same way that Charlemagne had done. It was not a centralized empire with a single court or a single set of laws or a single army like Charlemagne had been able to maintain. It was divided into these different uh, kingdoms and duchies and fiefdoms that all in different ways reported to the Habsburg dynast. And when it comes to the Low Countries in particular, Mary of Burgundy had faced a series of rebellions and had had to make concessions and capitulations allowing self-government to these small uh, you know, provinces within the Netherlands who wanted to be self-governing. And so the powers of the Habsburg rulers, once they acquired these various domains, were much more limited and indirect. Still, uh, once they had acquired the Low Countries and began sort of managing them as part of their empire, they adopted another motto, uh, quote, leave the waging of wars to others, but you, happy Austria, marry, for the realms which Mars awards to others, Venus transfers to you. So the Habsburgs kind of prided themselves on gaining so much territory and power through marriage, and as they say, through Venus, meaning through love, rather than through warfare. Uh, and it's true that they were sort of the masters of strategic uh, marriage diplomacy, but that's not to say that they didn't use violence and warfare as well when necessary to extend their power. And this was especially true after 1500 when these various sort of wars around Central Europe uh, really flared up. And arguably the, the high watermark of Habsburg power was the early years of the reign of Charles V. So Charles V came to power as the Habsburg uh, king and archduke and Holy Roman Emperor in 1519. And at the same time, he also inherited the crown of Spain. So his father had married uh, Juana, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Castile and Aragon, and so he was able to inherit through that line the rulership of Spain as well. So for the first few years of his reign, he was Holy Roman Emperor. So he was sort of titular ruler of this entire uh, you know, patchwork empire. He also was the direct ruler of Austria, of Hungary, of Bohemia, of the Habsburg uh, County in Switzerland, and of Spain and of the Spanish colonies and conquests overseas as well. So he had this entire colonial empire running through the Americas and across the Pacific all the way to the Philippines. So naturally, uh, he saw himself as sort of the new universal monarch. Uh, at least that was his ideal aspiration, was to be recognized as the kind of emperor of the entire world. Uh, people uh, observing him from abroad said that the he had an empire on which the sun never set, and indeed he, he really cut an intimidating figure across the diplomatic and military world. And he was very proud that his domains were polyglot, that they were an assemblage of all kinds of people, people of different churches, different uh, customs and different languages, and he was proud of being multilingual himself. And he's been quoted in many chronicles as saying, quote, I speak in Latin to God, Italian to women, French to men, and German to my horse. Uh, now, it's doubtful that he ever really said that exactly word for word. That only came later, but there are many uh, accounts closer to his own lifetime that attributed things like that to him, that he would say, uh, you know, 
you need to speak many different languages in order to be an effective, impressive leader. You know, and he sort of adopted the ideal of the Renaissance man, the man of unlimited experience, multiple skills, worldliness, charm. And he argued that different languages served different roles, that, you know, French was a language of philosophy, of governance, uh, Italian, a language of romance and poetry, and German was a practical language, a language for uh, military and uh, administrative use. And so, uh, you know, when this quote of him was distilled, which he may or may not have said, he says, you know, I speak German to my horse. Uh, he probably grew up speaking mainly French. Uh, you know, he spent most of his early life in training to be an emperor in the Low Countries, in the Duchy of Burgundy. And the upper class there did not speak Dutch or Flemish. They spoke French. So he probably was mainly an everyday French speaker, which is ironic because France ended up becoming his main uh, enemy. He was able to assert his power fairly well when he needed to militarily and draw on these various resources. Uh, he won very important engagements like the Battle of Pavia, which I've mentioned before, in Italy in 1525. So he took up command of the Spanish army as King of Spain and was able to engage and defeat uh, King Francis of France. Uh, but Nonetheless, it was extremely difficult to manage these domains. And as I said, there was not a single central capital and central court that he could govern through all the time. In order to really administer effectively, he had to constantly travel around, which was tiring and time-wasting and expensive and dangerous. Uh, you know, whenever a monarch goes out on the roads, uh, he's subject to possibly being kidnapped or even or just dying in an accident or an assassination. So he decided after not very long to divide up his domains and he formally split his domains into eastern and western branches in 1522. So the eastern portion included Austria, Hungary and Bohemia. And he handed over the regency, the effective rule over these domains to his younger brother. And so these areas in later years came to be known as the junior line of the Habsburg domains because they ended up passing into the hands of that younger brother and his heirs. The western portion included Spain, eventually Portugal as well, the Netherlands, and the Spanish colonies in the Americas. So this is what came to be called the senior line, Habsburg domains. And these were passed down to Charles's son, Philip, who became Philip II. And you might remember Philip II is the you know, fervently Catholic counter-reformation monarch who builds El Escorial as his sort of central uh, church and state headquarters, who encourages and supports the Inquisition, who tries to invade England, who suppresses the Dutch revolt, uh, the Protestant Republican revolt in the Netherlands. And he establishes a fairly long-lasting Habsburg dynasty uh, in Spain and the Spanish Empire. But in the 1600s, this Habsburg line went into decline uh, because of uh, mismanagement, especially of the Spanish homeland, and also because of severe inbreeding. So this uh, Habsburg, the Habsburg dynasty had always been strategic about whom they married. Uh, and the Spanish Habsburgs kind of took this to an extreme and in a bad direction. They really didn't want to sort of degrade their status and primacy in Europe by marrying into any inferior dynasties. And also because they were fervently Catholic and anti-Protestant, they sort of cut the entire Protestant section of Europe out of their pool of potential 
uh, marriage partners, and they ended up becoming a severely inbred and even deformed uh, ruling house, which eventually finally died out in the year 1700. So the last uh, Habsburg monarch in Spain died in 1700, and they ended up being replaced by a Bourbon dynasty. But that's a whole other story. So the Habsburgs in the West, the senior line, died out first. Whereas the uh, junior line that ruled in Germany and the Holy Roman Empire and Hungary lasted for longer and were able to maintain their sort of supreme position as the premier ruling family dominating most of Central Europe. And they, from their base in Central Europe, tried to extend and assert their claim to kind of universal monarchy where they ought to be able to overcome all rivals and all limits to their power. But naturally, other uh, rulers around them saw this as a threat and ended up uh, rallying and circling against them. So very important obstacles quickly sprung up to Habsburg power that ended up thwarting their aspirations to universal monarchy. One of the most important of these was the Turks. So I already mentioned the Turks, uh, their sort of aborted invasion of Italy. Well, that was not the end of the Turkish advance into Central Europe, but rather they captured Serbia in 1522. So in the very same year when Charles V divided his eastern and western domains, uh, the Turks uh, captured Serbia and continued their rapid advance through the Balkans to Central Europe, and only seven years later, they laid siege to Vienna and were able to march right into Austria and attempted to capture the Austrian capital, the main sort of base of Habsburg power in the Holy Roman Empire. What saved the Habsburgs was not any great military performance in defense of their domains, but rather it was severe heavy rains that continued all through the spring and caused mud and severe flooding, which slowed down and sometimes completely halted the Turkish advance. And the main uh, military advantage that the Turks pressed was their very good strategy with gunpowder and gigantic cannon. Uh, well, with all of this rain and flooding, it was almost impossible to keep their gunpowder dry. And this really uh, weakened and put a damper on their ability to attack Vienna effectively. So after months of rain, they eventually lifted their siege and retreated from Vienna. And arguably, you could say that this failed siege of Vienna in 1529 was the high watermark of Ottoman power. Uh, but they continued to be a serious, threatening, and dynamic power in Europe through the 1530s and 40s. Uh, they were later beaten back somewhat when Philip II defeated them at sea at Lepanto in 1571. But nonetheless, they were able to rebuild their fleet fairly quickly afterwards, and they continued to be a significant power, both on land and at sea. Now, it's conceivable that the Habsburgs might have been able to make some sort of peace and coexistence with the Ottomans in the 1530s if they perhaps, you know, made an agreement that involved ceding control of Italy to the Turks uh, in return for the Ottomans accepting Habsburg overlordship of Europe. Uh, but this was thwarted by the Habsburgs' main enemy to the West, which was France. So uh, France saw the Turkish advance as a possible opportunity that could work to their advantage because they were struggling over borders and over control of, uh, you know, small tr strips of territory along the German-French frontier, the sort of areas of Alsace and Lorraine and uh, G uh, Geneva, areas like that. And they saw this rise of the Habsburgs as a major threat that was encircling them. 
You know, they now had Habsburg rulers to their east in Germany and Austria and to their southwest in Spain and uh, later in Portugal. So they saw themselves as possibly, uh, you know, a sitting duck for the rising power and aspirations of the Habsburgs. So they decided, well, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and the Turks are offering us an opportunity to encircle the Habsburgs. So in 1531, King Francis himself was quoted as saying to one of his diplomats, quote, I cannot deny that I wish to see the Turk all powerful and ready for war, not for himself, for he is an infidel and we are all Christians, but to weaken the power of the emperor, to compel him to make major expenses, and to reassure all the other governments who are opposed to such a formidable enemy. So it begins as this sort of flirtation of saying, well, you know, maybe it's not such a bad thing for us if the Turks uh, cause a problem for the Habsburg emperor on his eastern frontier. And not long after, uh, in the following year, they actually made a more or less open alliance with the Ottomans. So Francis and the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent sent embassies back and forth to one another, gifts, and then in the mid-1530s, they started actually conducting joint naval operations where French, small French fleets would act as guides and scouts for Turkish fleets sailing around Italy and attacking imperial ports on the coast of Italy as a way of harassing and trying to weaken the Holy Roman Empire. And this, of course, caused enormous scandal uh, throughout much of Europe to think that, you know, France was debasing itself by an open alliance with these infidels and enemies of Christendom. But, you know, politics makes for strange bedfellows. And this alliance actually culminated in 1543, when the Turks were again trying to harass uh, Habsburg ports, not only in Italy, but even as far west as Spain. And the French recognized that they needed uh, overwintering quarters to continue to supply their ships and keep up these attacks rather than having to withdraw every winter back to Constantinople. And so they openly offered to the Turks to harbor their ships at Toulon, at the main French port on the Mediterranean. So the French fleet, excuse me, the Turkish fleet was uh, docked and wintered at Toulon. The naval forces and diplomats and clergy from the Turkish Empire were housed and quartered at Toulon. Many French subjects were actually forced to vacate their homes and give quarter to these Turks. And the Cathedral of Toulon was even given over and made temporarily into a mosque for these Turkish uh, forces to worship in. So again, in a way, you could see this as a kind of, uh, you know, early model of interreligious coexistence, but there was no great idealism behind it. You know, this was a strategic move in response to the incredible, you know, meteoric rise of the Habsburg dynasty. The last major obstacle that really thwarted the Habsburgs' uh, rise to power was actually internal within their domains. So the Protestant Reformation began, of course, in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire, with Luther and his supporters in Germany, and then shortly after, the reformers in Switzerland. And Charles V, while he was still emperor, actually uh, tried to take this movement in stride. He believed that the Protestant reformers had some valid points, that the church did need to be reformed, and he knew that there was a long history and a long tradition of monarchs, including particularly Holy Roman emperors, trying to seize some control over the church within their domains and institute 
positive reforms. So he believed that he could act as a kind of arbiter between Luther and his opponents and between this new Protestant movement and the Catholic Church, that he could sort of oversee and uh, lead a council, a, a, an ecclesiastical council that could negotiate and work out uh, a program of church reform and a new liturgy, a new creed, and so on, and that he could set up a kind of reformed, a kind of compromise reformed church within the empire uh, with himself as the sort of leading governor. And this was not an unreasonable idea. It maybe was a bit idealistic, maybe a little naive. And it ended up failing because, firstly, because Luther simply rejected the idea. Luther was not a man interested in compromise. Luther was a man interested in principle and principle only and in the correct forms of worship and doctrine that he believed were strictly in line with scripture. And so he did not allow his followers to uh, partake in this sort of movement for negotiation or, or for an imperial council. And the moves towards negotiation broke down. And uh, basically, Charles V ended up forced to choose a side between the, the Catholics and the Protestants. And he ended up coming down on the side of the Catholics, uh, although he was not really able to suppress the Protestant movement because it was already too widespread and it involved too many of his subject princes and vassals in the empire over whom he really had very little political control. You know, outside of his personal domains in Austria and Hungary and Bohemia, he really didn't have much control. And uh, people like the Elector of Saxony were able to shelter uh, Luther and other reformers and keep this movement going uh, outside of his control. When Charles V sort of tried to suppress the spread of Protestantism and kind of force the Protestants to the table of negotiation, they formed a league against him called the Schmalkaldic League, uh, an alliance of Protestant states and principalities that <clears throat> actually took up arms and were able to uh, to oppose him on the field of battle in defense of their autonomy and their their uh, asserted right to control religious policy within their own domains. And the Turks actually encouraged, they sent emissaries and diplomatic messages into Germany and encouraged the Schmalkaldic League to ally with Francis. Uh, and this was something they were reluctant to do, not only because it was a Muslim ruler's idea, but also because Francis was a Catholic. Uh, but again, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and they ended up making a strategic alliance. So now you had Protestants within the empire and the French and the Turks all kind of ganging up together uh, against uh, Charles V and putting a lid on Habsburg power. And so eventually it was the Habsburgs who were forced to come to the negotiating table and they worked out the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, which basically forced uh, the Holy Roman Emperors to accept uh, the existence of Protestantism in those states and principalities within the empire where the local rulers wanted it to be tolerated. Just one year later, in 1556, Charles abdicated from his throne. Uh, he basically, it seems, had become disillusioned and exhausted and gave up on this dream of universal empire. So he abdicated and handed over the throne of the Western territories to his successor, and he retired to a small, remote Huronimite monastery in Spain. And he apparently took up uh, an ascetic lifestyle, not as ascetic and bare bones as the monks 
in the monastery around him, but he built a sort of small house for himself adjoining the monastery. Uh, he became very sick with gout and other diseases and kind of lived in a small bedroom with an open doorway to the chapel so he could just kind of stay at home and uh, observe mass being held in the adjoining room and probably, you know, sort of reflected on the failure of his uh, grand dream of, of world empire. He died two years later in 1558, and... After his death, there was something of a Spanish golden age under the rule of Philip that then was followed, as I said, by decline, especially after 1600. But there was continuing Habsburg power and strategic dominance in much of Central Europe, uh, even after Charles V. Uh, Rudolf II was the Archduke of Austria and Holy Roman Emperor from 1576 to 1612. And Rudolf is known today mainly because he encouraged art and science, especially alchemy and other occult arts. He uh, you know, patronized and dabbled into magic, sorcery, divination, and he was able to maintain Habsburg power in Central Europe, although he did not expand it the way earlier rulers had done. And so in a way, you could see Rudolf II as sort of the height of the Eastern, you know, junior line Habsburg dynasty. He launched a failed war against the Turks from 1593 until 1606. And so he, he hoped to roll back Turkish power and kind of reassert the Holy Roman Empire and Austria and control over Hungary. But he ended up basically in a stalemate. So you have a kind of holding pattern stalemate, holding pattern stalemate with an increasingly hard border between Turkish and Habsburg domains that basically cut through Hungary. So although Hungary was technically still, you know, formally one kingdom, it really was divided, almost like East and West Germany during the Cold War. And the Habsburgs were able to maintain this position, uh, sort of holding the line and uh, keeping control over most of Central Europe and serving as a kind of bulwark, really, of Europe against the Turkish advance for another 12 years after the end of this war uh, with the Turks. But in a way, the, the Holy Roman Empire was really in a precarious position. It was still very internally divided. It was divided between religious groups. It was divided between those who were loyal to the Habsburgs and saw them as protectors against the Turks, and those who saw the Habsburgs as oppressors who had wrongly usurped uh, control over what should be a decentralized confederation. And there continued to be feuding factions and parties uh, sort of vying for an opportunity to assert themselves in this very unstable empire. And the French, as I said before, continued to have sympathy and support for the Protestants within the empire and saw them as possibly valuable allies against the Habsburgs. So this kind of delicate balance of power was, in a sense, uh, you know, ready to fall apart, and everyone, kind of the wolves, were already circling. When in 1618, the uh, Habsburg ruler died, and the various kind of councils and estates around the empire held their meetings, their kind of pro forma meetings to hold these rubber stamp elections where they would merely, uh, you know, kind of automatically choose the next Habsburg heir as the new ruler. So it was simply assumed that the, the Habsburg heir would become the new uh, Holy Roman Emperor and that he would, of course, become the new Archduke of Austria and King of Hungary and King of Bohemia and all these various domains. However, the estates in Bohemia met in Prague and unexpectedly they 
chose a different ruler. They did not simply rubber stamp uh, elect the next Habsburg, but instead they choose uh, they chose Frederick the Elector Palatine. So Frederick was a prince of the state in West Central Germany called by various names, usually called the Palatinate or something like that, which was Reformed Protestant. And Frederick himself was a Reformed Protestant. So the estates in Bohemia had been sort of infiltrated uh, gradually by Protestants and sympathizers of the Protestant cause. And there had always been a kind of underground movement of Protestant sympathizers, particularly because of the, the Hussite heritage. So if we think back, uh, Bohemia was the kingdom that had embraced the teachings of Jan Hus and had seized control of the church and reformed the church in a kind of forerunner uh, event, a kind of precursor of the Reformation. And so ever since, there had always been uh, reformists and sympathizers to Protestantism. So when the Estates General met, they made this sort of surprise move of electing Frederick and inviting him to take up the Bohemian throne. This, of course, was a uh, humiliating slap in the face to the Habsburgs, who quickly dispatched generals and administrators to Prague to uh, shut down this estate council and nullify this election and try to force in uh, a new uh, proxy who would uphold Habsburg rule. And this led to the so-called defenestration of Prague, where the uh, guards guarding the the offices of this estate in Prague uh, accepted in one of these Habsburg Catholic emissaries and then promptly uh, ushered him to the window and threw him out the window. Uh, and he fell several stories but was able to survive. And this defenestration of Prague was, in effect, a kind of declaration of war. It was a declaration of war by the Bohemian estates against the Habsburgs and also of Protestants against Catholics and the Catholic Church. So this uh, Frederick took up rulership uh, of Bohemia, and this quickly prompted uh, a war where the Austrians sent in armies to try to uh, overthrow Frederick and reassert control of Bohemia. This naturally mobilized Bohemia's sympathizers and allies among the other Protestant states in Germany who rallied to their support. Uh, once it became a sort of religious war dividing the empire, the other Catholic powers in the area started to send their support for the Habsburgs, and it ended up sort of cascading into a broad uh, kind of Protestant versus Catholic world war. And it ended up dragging on for years. Uh, the Winter King, well, the, the, the King Frederick of Bohemia was eventually overthrown uh, by... Catholics uh, within his kingdom who were bolstered by a, an Austrian invasion. So they were able to overthrow him, chase him from the capital. He had to flee into exile. And because of his sort of short period of rule, which was only about a year and a half, he's been called the Winter King, you know, almost as if he only ruled for one season, although that was not true. It was a year and a half. Uh, so the overthrow of the Winter King kind of, you know, further added fuel to this, this cascading Protestant versus Catholic conflict. Other countries uh, intervened and became involved even outside the empire. Uh, King James of England and Scotland sent Scottish forces uh, in into the empire to try to uh, support the Bohemians. Uh, he also, he was a Presbyterian and hence a Reformed Protestant uh, as well. Eventually, Denmark and Sweden became involved. Uh, Gustavus Adolphus, the sort of famous, uh, super successful ruler of Sweden, uh, invaded and used new artillery tactics to uh, beat back the Catholic forces. And France, you know, <laughs> had divided loyalties. France was a Catholic state, and it did make some nominal gestures of support to the Habsburgs for a while early in the war. But then once they 
saw that it was possible that the Habsburgs might actually win and hence vanquish all kinds of uh, enemy, internal enemies in the empire and establish themselves as much more powerful absolute rulers than they had been before, then the French switched sides and instead sent an army through Alsace into the empire in support of the Protestant side. So, you know, much like in World War I and other later conflicts, it became a kind of consuming conflagration where people uh, ended up switching sides, not so much out of ideological sympathy, but just out of fear of one side winning so resoundingly that they would be an unstoppable force. And this war dragged on for 30 years. It's known as the Thirty Years' War. Uh, it tore back and forth, back and forth, all through Central Europe, but especially sort of Central and Western Germany were really devastated. Uh, towns were destroyed, fields were destroyed, uh, you know, infrastructure, dikes, bridges were destroyed. Uh, you know, civilization was almost leveled to the ground in large parts of Germany, especially the Palatinate, that reformed Protestant area where Frederick came from that became the sort of main uh, flashpoint of the struggle. And about eight to nine million people were killed. So, you know, by far the biggest, most destructive war, at least in Western history, until the 20th century. And it finally ended in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. And the Peace of Westphalia was actually a, a series of treaties signed among these various contending parties that were involved in the war. And the main agreement of the Peace of Westphalia was in a way really pathetic because it was just a recapitulation of what had already been established by the Peace of Augsburg, basically saying religious policy can be set by each individual ruler and prince within the empire, right? The Holy Roman Emperor does not have the power to control religious policy. And, and that was the main subject at issue in Bohemia and the defenestration of Prague and the overthrow of the Winter King. It was about, will Bohemia be Catholic or Protestant? And so the, the Peace of Westphalia simply said, each individual ruler sets their own religious policy. If, if the ruler is uh, Lutheran, they can set up a Lutheran church. If they're Catholic, it can be a Catholic state. But it also, it went a little bit further than the Peace of Augsburg in that it also said that if the ruler is Reformed Protestant, then they can make a Reformed Church, or even if they want to have religious toleration and religious freedom within their domains, that is their prerogative as well. So in a sense, it even further uh, weakened and fragmented uh, the, the empire and ensured that it would continue to be, you know, religiously divided. But it tried to take the issue of religion off the political table. Other treaties involved in the Peace of Westphalia also recognized the autonomy of, well, the, the independence, excuse me, of the Netherlands. So the Netherlands had been involved in an even longer sort of slow-burning revolt against Spanish rule. And uh, Spain, the Habsburg rulers of Spain, finally accepted Dutch independence and also uh, Swiss independence was recognized. So that confederation of Swiss cantons, which had always been technically under the umbrella of the empire, was formally accepted as independent as well. So the Peace of Westphalia, it really further, uh, you know, weakened the authority of the Habsburgs in what had been their own domains, but it did allow them to continue still as a major dynasty, still ruling over uh, Austria, Bohemia, Hungary, other domains, and uh, nominally occupying the Holy Roman Imperial Throne or whatever was left of it. Uh, it, it basically, the, the Thirty Years' War finally ended uh, the the political significance of the Holy Roman Empire as a significant political entity.
The Turks continued as well as a significant power on the eastern frontier. They did decline somewhat. There was corruption, inefficiency, uh, sort of institutional problems setting in within the Ottoman Empire. But nonetheless, they made another stab at trying to conquer Central Europe, and they again besieged Vienna in 1683. They regained some of their territory in Hungary and uh, that area, but not for very long. The Habsburgs were able to beat them back, and their siege of Vienna did fail. And basically after 1683, this is where we definitely see Ottoman decline uh, accelerating, including increasing loss of territory. So the Habsburgs were able to capitalize again for some degree, to some degree on this Turkish decline. And the dynasty eventually uh, formally ended when there was no male heir in 1740, and rule was passed to a female heir, Maria Theresa, who took up the throne as as empress and ruled from 1740 to 1780. And Maria Theresa was a fairly effective ruler. Uh, she was very good on the battlefield, uh, and she was able to maintain Habsburg power during her reign. But she also had some uh, weaknesses. Internally, she was very repressive and reactionary. Uh, she suppressed all opposition. Uh, she tried to reins reassert religious control over the empire and try to roll back uh, Protestantism. She very severely uh, persecuted uh, Protestants, Protestant sympathizers, free thinkers, deists, and basically reformers and dissenters of all kinds in her domains in Austria and Hungary. And this ended up really further aggravating divisions and discontent within those kingdoms and sort of spurring on the growth of opposition parties that... Uh, really weakened the legitimacy of Habsburg rule, and she became something of a villain to the growing kind of middle class and intelligentsia in cities like Vienna and Prague and, and Budapest. After she died, uh, rule passed down to her heirs, Leopold, later Joseph, uh, and they technically were, strictly speaking, according to uh, Central European tradition, they were not part of the Habsburg dynasty because their father was from an alternative house, the House of Lorraine. But they used the title Lorraine Habsburg. They sort of hyphenated their name to try to carry on sort of the prestige and the legacy of this Habsburg dynasty. And rulers who referred to themselves as Habsburg continued to occupy the throne in Austria and Hungary all through the 19th century and were finally only removed from power in 1918 with the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of World War I. And technically, some of their heirs still claimed the Austrian throne until 1961. <laughs> so the last the last open claimant to be a Habsburg ruler finally uh, you know, gave up the ghost in 1961. So all considered, this is a more than thousand year long uh, dynasty, which was an effective ruling force in Europe for more than 500 years. Uh, and although it, you know, it split into different branches, although it went through a female line at one point, uh, they really were a continuing kind of, uh, you might say, immovable object uh, in Europe for centuries, a sort of fixture on the European political landscape. And they did exercise power in new ways, you know, more directly using themselves as symbols, making themselves visible, uh, setting up a, a more centralized, a bureaucratic and military command structure, uh, centering on themselves. Uh, this was in many ways a, a modern dynasty, but they could never rule their domains in the same kind of absolute way 
that some other rulers did try to do, and to some degree succeeded, in more compact uh, kingdoms centering on a single capital, like France, Prussia, Russia, and also to some degree England. And the real uh, you know, champions of absolutism as a philosophy and as a model of governance uh, were, of course, the French, and especially the Bourbons uh, in France, who, of course, were the main European enemies uh, of the Habsburgs. So hopefully at some point later I'll be able to get around to talking about France and about the struggle to build an absolute monarchical state uh, in France, which reached a whole sort of other level of uh, of success and fanaticism than was ever seen in the Habsburg Empire. So thank you for listening. Uh, again, please go to my Patreon page if you're able to offer any support, and you'll get access to my patron-only uh, installments, including my account of my travels in England earlier this year, and my uh, half of my lectures on the history of the United States in 100 Objects, and half of my lectures on Myths of the Month. And although I am teaching now and I might not have as much time, I hope that I'll be able to produce uh, new segments of both of those series, uh, hopefully this month. So thank you again for listening. Uh,